1 Corinthians 12. We've been on this for a, a few weeks now. And the... Uh, <clears throat> Twelfth verse says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is the body of Christ. He's saying the body of Christ is very much like a human body. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Well, no, of course it's still part of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Well, no, it's just as much a part of the body as the eye is. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Well, there wouldn't be any. If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Well, there wouldn't be any. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Read that out loud with me, that 18th verse. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Thank you, Lord. Are you a member in the body of Christ? Yes, you are. When you're born again, the Spirit places you into the body. Thank God. And were you just placed in the body randomly? No. No. You are created a specific body part to fit in a specific place. And to do a specific job. Now, why would he be saying if the uh, ear says, "I'm because I'm, I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body," and he talked about the other par parts looking and wanting to be another part, comparing themselves? That must be a big problem in the body of Christ. Is people wanting to be something else instead of what they are? Did you hear that? Wanting to be something else. Wanting to be somebody else. Wanting to have another grace than the graces you've been given. Wanting a different place than the place that is your place. Well, it's that grass looking greener on the other side syndrome. I mean, it's easy to be romantic about something you don't know anything about. Right? Right? It's easy to look at somebody else's life that you know nothing about and imagine that it's so much better than yours. But I assure you, if you lived in their shoes for a few days, you'd find out they live in the same world, same planet you do, right? They have flesh like you do. They got to deal with people like you do, right? Right? The devil bother, tries to bother them and tempt them. There's still the curse in the earth where they live to. Right? No, there, there is no place uh, to operate in the body on the earth that has no challenges and has no temptations and has no issues. But I tell you where you don't want to be, in the wrong place. Because in the wrong place, you're not graced to be there and to do that, and that is the bad place to be. The place you want to be is your God-ordained place because that's where your God-given grace functions and operates. And oh yeah, you can have challenges there, but you're graced to overcome them there. You're graced to win again and again there. In your place and in your grace. Somebody say glory to God. So we've been talking for some weeks now on this subject. We're calling it graces and places. Graces and places. Every one of us 
has been placed or set in the body as it has pleased God. And we looked at several scriptures that told us that every one of us has been given gifts or graces that enable us to function in that place and do the job that that body part should do. Let me remind you of these verses. Don't turn there, just listen. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says, Every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that. Ephesians 4, 7. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 1 Peter 4 and 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Have every one of us been given gifts? Yes. Talking about spiritual gifts. Yes. Supernatural enablements and endowments. Has every one of us, every one of us, not just preachers, not just pastors, not just people that you think are so spiritual or specially anointed. Every one of us have been given gifts and graces. Now, it's sad. Many people live and die and never find out about their graces and their giftings and never get in their place. That's a sad thing, isn't it? But it's not God's fault. And it's not because he's made it difficult and complicated and hard. We've been getting into some reasons as to uh, what the issues are, but into some glorious truth in the Word of God about how to find your place. Are you interested? Yes. How to find and fill your God-ordained place in the body of Christ. I'm telling you, every person in this room can. Everybody watching my internet can, yes. can. Yes. It's easier than you might think. Yes. Yes. It's the devil who makes things complicated yes. and hard. The Lord's made it easy. Yes. You don't suppose the Lord's trying to hide his plan from you, do you? No. <laughs> Why would he do that? <laughs> He's got this amazing plan for you and graces and he hides it says now let's see if they can find that <laughs> that'll take them 50 years before they even get a clue are you kidding why would he do that I mean if the Lord didn't want us to find it it'd be no problem for him to make it where we couldn't find it no no he has not hidden things from us he's laid them up for us and made them available to us. And he said, seek. And you may never find out. Well, come on, help me. I'm quoting the words of Jesus, am I not? Ask. It'll be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Jesus, the head of the church, said this. Knock. It'll be open to you. Shall be. Not might be, sometimes is, sometimes not. Shall be, shall be, shall be. Do you believe that? Thank you, Lord. So it is his will for us to find our place and operate in it fully. We, one thing we've established, you can get online or you can go back in the Word Supply and get the previous teachings and lessons on this and get caught up. But one thing that we have uh, been establishing is that our place is God-ordained, not self-assumed. Who has set the members in the body as it has pleased him? He did. Very important. Go to 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, please. The fifth chapter and the 23rd verse. He said, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word sanctify also has to do with uh, uh, holy and separate and keeping you 
holy, your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body preserved blameless. Can you see a picture of from wherever you received him until all through your life, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are kept. Your whole being is kept. Spirit, soul, and body kept where? Kept in his will. Kept in his plan. Kept in his blessing. Kept in his protection. Can you see this? Now read the next verse. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Do what? Keep you. Oh, this is shouting ground right here, friend. We could shout about this the rest of the night, and it would be appropriate. Our God who has called us, who has created us the body part that we are, and has called us to the place in the body that we're called to, graced us and gifted us in the areas that we needed to be that body part and fill that place, he is faithful Amen. to guide us, lead us, direct us, keep us this year and next year and the next and the next as he tears his coming all the way to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say he's faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. The devil will try to tell you, oh, it's hard. It's so confusing. It's so hard. We've got millions, millions of church-going people that love the Lord that are just totally confused about where they're supposed to be or what they're supposed to be doing. I see people all the time. I talk to ministers that have tried nine different things the last six years. Did you hear me? They've been over here and they've been over there and they left this and they tried that and that flopped and they tried this and that failed and they did this. Well, now, friend, God is not leading them to do all that. Hmm? And they're frustrated and they're upset. Why won't God help me? Why won't God help me? Well, if you are an ear, God is never going to help you be an eye. You can pray and fast till you faint and fall out. Did you hear me? You can memorize the whole Bible. You can turn in 10,000 prayer requests, and the Lord is never going to change his mind and say, oh, okay, you want to be an eye. I understand. Fine. Zappo. There you go. <laughs> now you are an eye. Never going to happen. Because that would be an admission that he either missed it the first time around or decided your idea was better. <laughs> Neither one of those is right or can be right. So like we said concerning parents and talking to their children, telling them, honey, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. Well, that's not really true. If Jesus is your Lord, it's already been decided what you're supposed to be and do. And it's not for you to decide what you want to be and do. It's for us to discover what's already been foreordained. And the Lord's not making it hard. He is faithful. Somebody say faithful. faithful. Say it again, faithful. faithful. God is faithful. He's faithful. Now how can you find your place? and develop in your graces. There are two parts to this, like everything else. There's God's part, and there's your part. We've already been talking some about God's part. He's faithful. You don't have to be concerned about him doing his part. His part is foreknowledge and faithfulness. He knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? And he is faithful to lead you and I in the right way. Our part is faith and faithfulness. God is faithful. But the question is, are we? Faith is such a big factor. Last week we got into this. In a step or part one, I should not step, part one 
of uh, finding your place in grace is the call and the desire. There's a call. You know, you hear this when Christians come and, and they get serious about God. They start coming to church regularly and start reading their Bible regularly and start praying regularly. Then they'll come up again and again and say, you know, I feel like I got a call on my life. Yeah, you always did. <laughs> You're just becoming aware of it. When you live up to your eyes in the world, you're oblivious to it. You don't notice it. But when you begin to get serious about him and draw near to him and he draws near to you, you begin to realize he's got a plan for my life. There's something I'm supposed to be doing. That's true for every believer. Do you understand that now? Well, I feel like I got a call on my life. Everybody has got a call on their life. It's because you're not called to stand behind a pulpit and preach or called to be a missionary or called to be a pastor. doesn't mean you're not called. Right. Most of the body of Christ is not called to be a speaking gift, a preacher or a teacher. That's a relatively small percentage of the whole body. And yet everybody's just as called. Everybody's got a call. And it's sad that you've got a handful of people that's doing the work of the ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm preachers and teachers, yes, but I'm talking about all the people, all the helps that it takes. How many know it takes a lot of people besides uh, somebody standing up here preaching for this church to go? Yes. Oh, man. It takes a lot of people in a lot of places. And that's true all over the world, all over the body of Christ. But even then, it, it's still with churches like ours. We have a relatively high percentage of participation. But I, you know, I'd be kidding myself to say that most of the people are working. It's too quiet, isn't it? You got a whole lot of people that are not on any teams. And if they were working for the Lord doing something somewhere else, that'd be great. But they're not. They're not. And, uh, Sometimes people say, well, I don't, you know, I don't like to hear that all the time about the service teams and all this. Listen, friend, this is for you. Your life is soon going to be over. And so will your opportunity for serving the Lord in the earth. And so will your opportunity for being a blessing and getting reward. I assure you, you need to serve at least as much as we need you to serve, maybe more. Are y'all with me, friends? Where are you supposed to be? What are you supposed to be doing? Well, I'm just supposed to be a Christian. There's nobody that's only supposed to be a Christian. <laughs> and reckon how many millions of folk we got, though, that think that's their only call is maybe show up at church once in a while and say, I'm a Christian. That's my call. No, no, you have graces. You have things that would make you a blessing somewhere, that would make you a help, make you a benefit, if you would. Go with me to uh, Matthew, Matthew 22. The first thing we touched on was call and desire. If you were here last week, we went into that quite a bit, that the call and the desire helps you identify your place. Deep calls unto deep. And there are things that will appeal to you. And you might think they appeal to everybody that way, but they don't. I know looking back, uh, and, and I'm going to talk a little more about myself and Phyllis and our call. And it's not to, to draw attention to us, but I know how the Lord has led us to get from where we were to where we are. And I'm not claiming that we've done everything perfectly, but I know that we have, at least in some measure, walked in the plan of God for our life. And uh, that means so much. And uh, looking back, I'm learning, we've been doing it long enough now that I'm, I'm beginning to see some of the ways that he led us and helped us to do the right thing at the right time. And it's the same for everybody. You may not be called to preach, but you're called to do something. 
and he leads in the same ways. And I know uh, <clears throat> when I was uh, just newly arrived at, at Rainbow Bible Training Center, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about how the Lord got us there. Uh, Brother Hagen, Kenneth Hagen, announced that he was going to start a prayer and healing center. And uh, they were going to train, he called them, divine healing technicians. People that would learn how to be led by the Spirit. To see how to minister to people that were needing healing. And when he said that, I thought, oh, wow. Now, that'd be just the neatest thing ever. <laughs> and, and nobody knew me. I just got there, a little dumb country boy. And, and I looked around. I thought, well, probably everybody in this room feels the same way. I mean, why would I think I'd get to do that? But you know, by the grace of God, they picked two people the next year, and I was one of them. <laughs> Glory to God. And one thing led to another, and I worked in that ministry for 20 years. And looking back now, it was, there was no other place on the planet where I would have developed better. That was my place for then. And that was where I could begin to find the graces that God had put in me and on me and begin to exercise them and begin to develop them. And the Lord helped me to see some years later, he said, you were wrong about that. I thought, what? You said probably everybody here feels that same way. He said, they didn't. Everybody there? Most people didn't feel the way you did about it. Why? Because when I heard that, that's my call. Are you listening? And so something in me leapt up. And I thought, oh, glory to God. Now that would be... The thing, wouldn't it? And then I caught myself and looked around and thought, well, look at all these people. I mean, they probably all feel that way. No, he said they didn't all feel that way. Many of them heard it and thought, oh, okay. That's the last they ever thought of it. But me, I thought about it all day. And I thought about it all that night and all the next day and all the next day. And every time he said something about it, I got excited. And then they said, you know, we need somebody that had volunteered to go over here. They hadn't built it yet. To go over here and, and, and counsel people after the service. They need people to arrange the chairs. They need people to do this. Amen. And one thing led to another until when it came time for them to put some folk in there. I was one of the ones they picked, and it was the Lord that they did. Are you with me, friends? Yes. I'm trying to say the call. And the desire, one calls to another. Now, we talked about that God works in us to will and do of his good pleasure. He's the one that put that in me. He's the one working in that. That wasn't just a natural desire I had. He put that in me. And he got me at the right place at the right time for the next step, for the next move. Now, notice, though, in uh, Matthew 22 and verse 14. Put it up on the screen for us, please. Matthew 22, 14. What does it say? Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. So not everybody who's called is chosen. In fact, Apparently, most of the ones called don't wind up chosen. Only a few of the many that are called are chosen. Got to be true. The master said it. Why is that, though? Uh, <clears throat> go with me to the book of Acts. We looked at this last week. We need to look at it again. Acts 17 and 26. God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The Amplified says, 
What's that verse 26? He made from one common origin, one source, one blood, all nations of men. Are we all related? Yes. Uh-huh. All nations of men to settle on the face of the earth, having definitely determined their allotted periods of time and the fixed boundaries of their habitation, their settlements, lands, and abodes. Where you were born was no accident. Where you grew up was no accident. The people you were around, the people that became your friends, the people that became your teachers and your mentors and your, your elders, the influences in your life were not happenstance, not random. I know people try to believe that, but they're not. Now, you know, uh, that doesn't mean all the bad stuff that happened in your life was the will of God. Because, you know, parents haven't always followed the plan of God. And that can affect the kids. But, why weren't you born in the 1600s instead of now? Hmm? Why do you know about Arkansas instead of Germany? If you'd have been born on the other side of the world, you wouldn't see things the way you do. Right? You wouldn't be the same person. These things are not random. Who, where you've been and who you've been around and what you've had opportunity to be around is no accident. Read it again. Put it up on the screen. In the Amplified, Acts 17, 26. He have, has all nations of men to settle on the face of the earth, having definitely determined their allotted periods of time. That lets us know this is our time. Yes. Your people say, I should have been born in another time. No, you shouldn't have. You're insulting God. I should have been this, or I should have been that. I should have. You think you know more than him? No. Hush, such silly talk. Yeah. Foolish, ignorant talk. You're exactly in the time you're supposed to be in. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God's allotted the periods of time and the fixed boundaries of their habitation. Tonight we're talking about locations and associations. You can help identify what you are, your body, the body part that you are, and your graces by making note of these things. Locations and associations. Say that out loud. Locations. And, and so locations are where you've been and where you are. Associations are who you've been around and who you're around now. Looking back now, I can see that so clearly in our life. Uh, back as a teenager... When I was 10 years old, but prior to my teen years, the, my dad became involved in martial arts. And he put me in a school when I was 10. And I enjoyed it. I mean, I ate it up. And by the time I was 15 or 16, man, I, I had been doing it, you know, steady those years. And, and that's what I was deciding I'm going to do. I wanted to be a full contact fighter. It was the precursor of the ultimate fighting stuff you see today. That didn't exist then. So people were more in their styles. Our particular style was a Japanese style. And by the time I uh, was 16, 17 years old, I was training every day. I was doing everything I needed to do, preparing. I was willing to go anywhere 
in the world to get the, the next level of training. I had considered going to Okinawa, and I was ready to do it and preparing to do it. And God got a hold of me. <laughs> I sure am glad because <laughs> by now, <laughs> even if I had done well, whew, it takes a toll on the body. And uh, <clears throat> even if I'd done well, of course, it not being uh, my grace and place, I wouldn't have had the anointing. You understand if I'm supposed to be preaching and I'm fighting, That's a good way to get hurt, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and I said, you know, what is it, a session or two ago that, you know, maybe I would have been a hoodlum or something if I hadn't went through it. No, really, a fighter was what I was looking at. Uh, and so the Lord began to get a hold of me. And we got a hold of some uh, faith teaching. And Phyllis and I both, and we're 17 years old and 18 years old, and and uh, for a couple of years there, I was distraught. I was so dissatisfied. I couldn't be satisfied with my working out. I couldn't be satisfied with my plans to become a fighter. I mean, I had whatever good country boy needs. I had a, had a pretty wife. I had a fast car. I had a good pickup. I had a dog that'd catch my Frisbee. <laughs> I made decent money. I mean, for out where we were, one of the better jobs in the little community, and yet I got miserable. Right. Yeah. I got so much I should be thankful for, but I got completely unhappy. Right. Thank God, because yeah. elsewise I'd still be there. Right. Yeah. Did you hear me? In that place, doing that thing, discontentment can help alert you that there's something else you're not in yet. Deep calls to deep. If you think there's more out there, <laughs> it's because there is. <laughs> People say, oh, just be satisfied. No, be thankful, but no, there's always more. Amen. And so it took me a couple of years being unhappy, seeking God, praying, until I finally began to realize and the Lord began to put things in front of me, uh, faith teaching made its way to us. That changed our life. Began to learn about being redeemed from the curse of the law, introduced to Brother Kenneth Copeland's ministry and, and then uh, the Kenneth Hagin's ministry. And uh, one of their publications came to the our little mobile home one day, and I picked it up, and it was a uh, graduating class from Rama. They all had their red robes on and, and their hats, and I looked at that. They're all trained to go out in the ministry now, and, and just for a moment, I thought, wouldn't that be neat? And then I thought, oh, are you kidding? I mean, <laughs> that's just preposterous to even, and I, I threw it aside. But I was seeking God. I thought, Lord, what is it? Because I knew he wasn't satisfied with me staying where I was and doing what I was doing. And I was discontent because I could sense he wasn't happy with it. And I didn't know much about him. I knew he was real. And I kept trying to get him to talk to me in an audible voice. Or give me a vision. Or let me see something with my eyes. And the more carnal you are and the more immature you are, that's, you keep wanting to see something with physical senses. But he's spirit. I said he's spirit. And he communicates with your spirit. I remember getting on the ground and praying and getting on the floor and praying, God, I said, what is it? What? What, what do you want? Well, he, I got a call on my life. And it's time for me to pursue it. And I had not a clue. Me being a preacher, I wouldn't think about being a preacher. I was thinking about being a fighter. I wasn't working on knowing verses. I was working on uh, flying hook kicks <laughs> and ridge hands. 
all day and all night. That was my world. And uh, finally, I begin to, uh, you know, it, it begins with a willing heart. Somebody say willing heart. Say that. You're never going to find out what God has for you until your heart is absolutely open and willing to do in anything that he tells you to do. The least bit of unwillingness will be a blockage between you and him. I remember the times I'd get in the floor, I'd get on the ground and say, God, I, I'll do it. Whatever it is, I'll do it. And I began to realize eventually he's got a call on my life. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I still didn't know that that meant teaching and preaching. I just thought, well, maybe I'm to help somebody. Maybe I'm to help my pastor. or Maybe I'm to, you know. Because like I said, I'm a, I'm a fighter. I'm not a preacher. And so I, I finally said to him, I said, now, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do, but I, I don't know how. And I was willing to go to the ends of the earth to sit under the right people to train. And I'm asking you for this. If I'm going to serve you, I'm asking you for the same thing. I'm asking you to put me with the right people where I can train like I'm supposed to and develop like I'm supposed to. I didn't realize it, but he was leading my prayer. He, he gave me enough understanding to pray that. And do you know, in eight months' time, I was sitting at the feet of Kenneth Hagin. I was sitting four feet from him, about 12 foot under the platform. And I was there for 20 years. And that was exactly where I needed to be to train. You, your spirit's got to be built up and your faith's got to be built up to the place where he can tell you and you not pass out. I want you to do this. I want you to go here. I want you to be this. I want you to do that. And, and you, for you to actually look up and go, well, okay. All things are possible to him that believes. As long as you're with me. How many of you got to have a certain amount of faith? Just to hear it and believe it's possible. See, that first time I saw that magazine, my faith wasn't there. Because that was where I'm supposed to go. I was supposed to go there. I was supposed to be one of the ones in the red robe. Yep. And the first time I looked at it, my faith wasn't there. It was there for about five seconds. <laughs> and then my head kicked in. And I looked around where I was in my little 1969 Marriott mobile home with no money at all and never been out of town hardly and I thought, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. So my faith wasn't there. But over the course of the next two years, looking back now, it was sitting on that little imitation leather couch. You know what that is? That's plastic. <laughs> With the well-used red shag carpet. <laughs> Listening to those tapes, listening to those tapes, listening to those tapes, listen to, somebody say, listen to the tapes. And that's one reason why we have a word supply that is no charge. Because I know what that did for Phyllis and I. Amen. And we didn't have to buy those tapes. The person that Phyllis was working for, he had them, and he kept insisting that we listen to them. And, of course, you know, when your boss kept saying, listen to it, you wanted to. We didn't do it at first, but he was so insistent. She's finally to appease him. She said, okay, I'll take some home. And she took them home, thought, well, he'll listen to one, and that'll be it. And, I mean, we got hooked. We got addicted. <laughs> and we listen to that night and day. I'd come in from work and get a bite to eat and plop down on that couch and be there till bedtime. And we did that night after night after night after night. What was God doing? He was getting faith in us so that he could tell us what he wanted us to do and us not pass up. Right? He was getting faith in us, getting faith in us, getting faith in us. And so... Uh, it came up in our hearts after a couple of years that we should go out to the camp meeting. The kind of think, well, I, I'm, I'm going too fast, getting ahead of myself. Uh, I, I've listened to all the tapes he had of Brother Copeland and listened to a lot of them two and three times and more. 
And then he kept telling her, well, here's another fellow I think you ought to listen to, Kenneth Hagin. And she told me, I said, "Uh uh-uh, no, I don't know who this Hagin fellow is. (laughs) But And I I know that I don't know much right now, and so I don't want to get confused. And so I know I like this guy right here, so I'm just going to stay with him. And and he said, well, uh, this fellow talks about being influenced by this fellow. Uh, Talking about Brother Copeland being influenced by Brother Hagin. And I said, well, that's all fine and good, but no. (laughs) <laughs> I know that sounds funny now, but that's, that's where it was. Eventually, he got me to listen to one of Brother Kenneth Hagin's tapes. And oh, man, I thought, yeah, I like this too. And so one thing led to another, led to another, and I got some of his books, and we fed on them, and, and we began to get their magazine and begin to partner with them and sold them, what was it, $20 a month, I think it was, five in the beginning, in the beginning, a month. We got up to 20 at one point. And then more. But uh, uh, we found out about the uh, camp meeting. And we thought, boy, that'd be a great thing to go to. And so it took all the faith we had to go to camp meeting. Uh, I mean, all the faith we had. We, we said, okay, we're going. We had learned about confession. We're going to the camp meeting. <laughs> She'd look at me, I'd look at her. We're going to the camp meeting. <laughs> and the devil would say, you ain't going nowhere. You're not getting out of Leake County. It's in Mississippi where we live. You're not going anywhere. We didn't have a decent car to make the trip. We didn't have money for gas. We didn't have money for a hotel room or, or the meals. Or, but we had learned. Call those things, be not as though they were. See, two years of listening to tapes is paying off. Can you see this now? God's got us to a place where, now, now let's just stop right here, pause. What am I talking about? I'm talking about finding your place. Are you with me, friends? I'm talking about finding your place. I believe Phyllis and I are in our place. Right now. Today. How did we get here? How'd God get us from where we were to here? And how will he get us to the next places? How does he get anybody there? He works with everybody exactly the same way. What if we hadn't been obedient to listen to the tapes? Hmm? See, Christians don't realize how important it is to simply show up at church. They don't realize. But a failure to do that leads to something else, leads to something else. You lay out of church long enough. You're not reading your chapters. You're not getting the thing. How many of you are supposed to be getting something every day? You're supposed to be getting something every week. You're supposed to be getting something every service. And this is cumulative. It has a cumulative effect of faith and strength in you. And if you don't do it and you miss this and you slough off with this and goof off and don't get that and you you say that ain't important and you let that slide and you miss that, missing the little things repeatedly will cause you to miss the big thing. You get there and it'll come up and you won't do it. Your faith won't be there. Your confidence won't be there. Well, we kept saying we're going. We're going to the camp meeting. Going to the camp meeting? Going to the camp meeting. Yes, we are. How? We don't know. But we're going. How are you going to go? We don't know, but we're going. And so we made arrangements. We took off time from our work, and we made arrangements and, and uh, uh, you know, just didn't know a thing about how to travel or anything else. we just going to go. Sure, there's a place to stay somewhere. And... We'll make it somehow. And uh, came time to go, and I guess it was uh, mom and dad loaned us their car, I think it was. And we were happy about that. We got a way to go. And, of course, you still need money. And so the, that day, the last day, and the day before that, I guess it was the day of, before we were going, people started handing me money. And I didn't tell them anything. I wasn't pulling on them. And same thing happened to Phyllis. I didn't know it. But we, we got in the car and we got our stuff and we headed out. And I said, guess what? 
She said, what? I said, I got money. <laughs> she said, well, you ain't the only one. I got money too. I said, well, let's see it. We pulled out our money. We thought, oh, glory to God. And we drove to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Never been out there before. Thought, boy, that's a big trip. And uh, we uh, found us a place to stay in the rough part of town and got lost every night <laughs> coming back from the service, didn't we? Man, they had one-way streets, you know, and big four-lane highways. Whew. <laughs> and we were so excited to be there that we didn't want to be in the back too far, and we wanted to get everything so we'd get there real early and stand in line for hours to get a good seat. And then we did. And then we'd be there all day long and eat nachos <laughs> or peanuts or <laughs> popcorn in between the service, in the convention center, you know, and they had some vendors outside. And, and so then we'd stay there all day. We'd be there all day long, and sometimes the service would be over, you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and then we got to find our way back and get lost. <laughs> And wouldn't find your room till you know, 1 o'clock in the morning. And then you got to get up at 5 because you want to be there early and find your place. It was some week now. But you know we had plenty of money to do what we needed to do. I mean, we didn't live large, but we, we were there. And while we were there, our lives was changed. I saw, never seen anything like it in my life. I saw 10,000 people stand up and speak in tongues all at the same time. I thought, glory to God. I didn't know there was this many tongue talkers in the whole world. <laughs> There's something going on here, man. And the excitement got a hold of me and her. And we were there, you know, some of us said, bless your darling heart. You're standing up all day and all night. Hey, don't feel sorry for us. We were enjoying every bit of it. We were drinking it in. We were th everybody. We wanted to hear everybody and the whole thing. And they said, well, they're having uh, tours out to Ramah Bible Training Center in Broken Air just a few miles away. And we both were impressed to, to go take the tour. So we went and took the tour, and they're leading us around through the buildings, and, and uh, something happened. I looked at her. She looked at me. We thought, oh, boy. What is this? The presence of God was on us, strong. Got back in the bus, like a little school bus. They were shuttling people back and forth, taking us back downtown to the convention center. She looked at me and she said, it stinks here. <laughs> Am I telling it right? It stinks here. <laughs> Why is she saying that? Because it was downtown Tulsa in the summertime, close to the refinery. Yeah. And boy, in that August heat, that, that refinery can smell. And it gets pretty stout in the, in the summertime, especially. And uh, she looked at me and she said, you ever knew you were supposed to do something and didn't want to do it? I played dumb. I said, what? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and we both knew we were supposed to come back and go to school there. Now, uh, we wrestled with it some for the next few months. And, um, you know, leaving your home, leaving your, your folks, leaving your friends, leaving everything you've ever known, and going where to do what? Nobody, we don't know anybody out there. And to do what? What are you going to do? And, and here's a big one for folks who have never had any money. <laughs> Where is the money going to come from? A place to live and pay tuition and all that. Listen to me, friends. None of that matters. Now, people get hung up on it, and they go, well, what about the kids? Where are they going to go to school? And where am I going to work? And, and what about this? And they let that stuff talk them out 
of obeying God. I'm going to get ahead of myself just a little bit here. Many are called. Few are chosen. You know why few are chosen? Because few follow. That's it in a nutshell. Few follow. Looking back, there's so many places we could have missed it. We could have talked ourselves out of it. But the plan of God is not complicated. See, there's a time when we knew you're supposed to go to the camp meeting. We knew that. We could have stayed home. We could have easily talked ourselves out of it and told ourselves, you know, you don't have the money. You can't do it. There's no way. You got to stay here and work. You got to do what you, you know, there's a thousand reasons why not to go. And if we hadn't gone, we'd have never taken the tour. We'd have never been on the campus. Are you with me now? What would have happened? I might not be looking at you. I might not be in the ministry. But it wouldn't have been because I couldn't find the will of God. It wouldn't have been because it was complicated and I couldn't sort it out and it was too hard. It would have been because I knew something to do and didn't do it. Well, if it's so important, if your whole life plan was connected to that, why didn't the Lord tell you? You've got to be there. It's your now. He does not going to. He expects you to walk by faith. And so he'll give you one step. Go to the meeting. And go into that meeting, there can be the thing that is pivotal for the rest of your life. And you may not know it. You won't know it until you get there. Can you see why the devil fights so hard to trip people up and keep people out? Get them to procrastinate. And Well, maybe I'll go next year. The Lord didn't say go next year. He said go now. Well, maybe I'll do this. And we'll wait till the kids get a little older. And we'll do this and do that. Listen, friend. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That's how you miss God. That's how you, you, you mess up your life. Uh, more than one, after we got out there, and, and eventually I, I taught in the school, and, and, and there were a number of people that come to me over the years, oh, Brother Keith, I think I'm supposed to go. And, and, and I said, well, you know, you, not everybody's supposed to go, but if you are supposed to go, nothing else will do. And they said, I know I'm supposed to go, but I got all this debt and I got all these problems and I need to clear it out. I said, well, I'll believe with you. Let me pray with you. And we prayed and believed God. And within less than a year, they were totally out of debt, totally out of debt. All those situations worked out and I fully expected to see them at registration and they weren't there. And so what happened? Well, you know, mom and them's getting older and I just thought maybe I better stay until some things happen with them. Does that sound familiar? You remember anything in the Bible about that? Go with me to Luke. Luke 5 and 10. It says, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon, Jesus said to Simon, fear not. Isn't that the big thing that hinders people? Fear not. From henceforth, you'll catch men. How many of their life's about to change? I said, is their life about to change? What have they been doing up till now? Fishing for fish. Fishermen. They do fishermen things. They hang out with other fishermen. They got fishermen schedule. Fishermen thoughts. Eat fishermen food. Go to fishermen places. Right? And all that is about to change. He said, don't be afraid. You're about to be a man catcher. And when they brought their ships to land, come on, help me out. When they brought their ships to land, they started looking at their bills. Huh? And talking with their kids and had a vote on it. <laughs> huh? They had a family meeting. <laughs> That's how people miss God. When the Lord says, do it, nothing else matters. Nothing. Nothing. 
Why? You say, well, my kids matter. Well, God knows about your kids. If he tells you to do that, he's already got something wonderful for your kids. Well, I got to know what it is. No, you don't got to know what it is. You need to obey God and you'll find out what it is. Well, I got to know about the money. No, you need to obey God. Well, I got to have the money first. I got to know that. No, no, no. You got to obey God first. Then you'll find out. We thought, well, you know, what would we do for money? Well, we just remember the two years of listening to tapes. It's paying off now. Phyllis and I agreed to do it and set our face. We, we already learned how to believe God. We said we're going to the camp meeting, and that worked. <laughs> so now we're going to Ramah. How you going to go? I don't know. We're going. And uh, we agreed on it, set our face to go that way, started preparing to go that way. Didn't have the money at all. Didn't know anybody out there, nothing. And you know, the, the guy that Phyllis worked for went to a seminar, continuing education type thing. She worked for a doctor. And he just happened to sit down beside a guy that looked at him and said, I'm really needing to hire an assistant. He said, well, where are you from? He said, Tulsa. <laughs> and he said, well, I know somebody that's going to Tulsa. She's my assistant. And she's one of the best ones you ever had. Just don't ask her to type. <laughs> he said, well, I don't, I don't need typing. I need to. He said, well, man, she's tops. He said, well, uh, that's great. And what happened? He told you that and, and you called him and he hired you sight unseen for more money. Four times the money. And over the next several years, God, what, doubled, tripled his practice and she made bunches of money. We'd have never found out about that if we'd have had to have the money before we're going. Can you see this, friends? What did they do? Verse 11, help me out. What'd they do? They forsook all and did what? Who gets called? Who gets chosen? Many are called. Who's the one that gets chosen? Obviously, these men are chosen, aren't they? How, I mean, how many understand and believe that the 12 found their places? Did they find their places? Absolutely. How'd they get there? How'd they get there? Could they have missed God right here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They could have said, go where? You mean leave my fishing? Do what? Ramble around the country with you and have meetings? <laughs> Man, if you get in your head, you can talk yourself right out of the plan of God. What'd they do? What'd they do? They didn't have all the answers. But they forsook all and did what? Help me out. What'd they do? They followed him. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. After these things, Jesus went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And what did he say to him? Follow me. Is he calling him? I said, is he calling him? Was he one of the chosen ones? How do we know? How do we know he was chosen? Verse 28. He what? He was making money hand over fist at what he was doing. Wasn't all on the up and up, but <laughs> money was coming out of his ears. <laughs> and what did he do? What did he do? He left it all and followed this preacher. They didn't know he was the son of God at this point. But they knew the spirit of God was on them. And they knew this was real. And aren't you glad they didn't think, overthink it? What'd they do? They did like the goose does. <laughs> as 
something tugging on them. So they just head that way. Huh? They did like the salmon does. There's something out there, a specific place is calling to that salmon. And something in that salmon is calling to that place. How do they get there? Not by thinking. <laughs> but by swimming. Not by planning and plotting and discussing. Oh, we humans. <sighs> Some people are worse than others too. Oh, dear me, they will talk and talk and talk and talk till your ears fall off <laughs> and do nothing when all the talking is done. Yep. They didn't intend to do anything when they started talking yes. except talk. <laughs> Friend, you got talkers and you got doers. Yes. Which one are you? When the Lord says, come on, huh? Tell me what it's time to do when he said, come on. Come on, follow me. I'm going somewhere. I'm on a mission. The Father has sent me. Here I go. Come on. What was their call? Their call was to help him, wasn't it? Their call, they had a place close to him to help him and to assist him. It was foreordained before they were born, before the foundation of the world, God saw the end from the beginning. They might not have had a clue till he showed up. But when you know, it's a dangerous thing to not do it. Isn't it? Keep reading. Actually, it's in Luke, but we'll go to another place. Many are called, few are chosen. Who are the few that are chosen? The ones that will follow. Why are there many that are not chosen? They won't follow. They just won't. 9.23. He said to them all, if any man, will come after me, let him do what? Deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? I had to die to my dream of being a uh, a champion fighter. I know it might not sound much to you now, but back years ago, that was big to me. And I had to die to that. I had to come to the place where, okay, well, Lord, if you don't want me to, you know, you try to make it, well, Lord, I'll be a witness for you in the ring. <laughs> but that wouldn't fly. That would be, he didn't accept that. And you, you keep trying because you get, you get fixated on something. And if that's all you've planned for, people do the same thing in all kinds of areas of life. They, they picked out their studies. They picked out their majors. They picked out their apprenticeships. Their parents got involved and, and whatever. And they've got them a path and they've got them a place. But so many times, even among church going folk, it's not the plan of God. Right. It's something they've come up with. And I had to die to that. Phyllis was going to be a nurse. And was, those are, that's a great profession. And I have great respect for athletes. You can, you can be a witness in any area. Unless it's not the one you're called to. <laughs> right? If you're an ear... You can never be a good witness in the eye place, no matter how sincere you are. And I had to die to that. Didn't you know what he said? Deny yourself. You got to die to what you thought you wanted. I found out it's better not to come up with all that stuff to start with. <laughs> you just have to die to it anyway. Just go find out what he wants to start with. 
You say, Lord, what do you want? <laughs> what, what is your plan? Look in the 59th verse of that same ninth chapter. 59. <clears throat> 59. He said to another, follow me. He said that often, didn't he? Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said what? Let the dead bury their dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. That sounds hard. But how many know Jesus said, if you love uh, father or brother or sister or mother or wife or children, whoever, more than me, you're not worthy of me. You remember that? People think it's a godly thing. Well, I'm going to take care of this and I'm going to take care of that. You better do what he told you to do. The best favor you ever did your family was obey God completely. Yes. If you're supposed to be doing something else, you say, well, I'm going to stay with them and help them. You'll be more in their way because you won't be graced and you're going to be unhappy because you're out of the will of God. You need to be where you're supposed to be. Right? That's it. Period. Not what you think. Not what somebody asked for. But what he said. Somebody say what he said. What he said. What he said. He said uh, well, verse 61, similar thing. Another one said, Lord, I will follow you, but. <laughs> Conditions. That doesn't work. He's the head of the church. You don't make deals with him. I know people try all the time, but he don't do deals. <laughs> Somebody said, well, it's his way or what? That's it. He's not going to change and say, well, okay. I had the perfect plan picked out from before the foundation of the world, but <laughs> I will compromise and I'll give some, and you give some, and we'll meet together somewhere. Ah, oh, you thinking about somebody else? <laughs> uh, uh. He said, uh, "Let me go and and bid farewell to those who are at home at my house." Can you hear a sad tone in his voice? Uh, I'll follow you. <laughs> just just let me go tell Mama and then bye. And uh, I want to tell old Yeller bye for one last time. <laughs> I, I want to see Bubba and them and hug their neck and <laughs> sissy and them and oh God. But but I'll go. You don't qualify. That's right. That's not my words. Because you're acting like you're having a sacrifice so terrible don't realize how privileged you are that he would call you knowing all your weaknesses and, <clears throat> and still call you <laughs> and give you a place and anoint you and use you and then you look up like you're doing him some tremendous favor and like well let me what did he say come on read it what did he say no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What do you do? Put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Somebody say, don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look back. Say it again. Don't look back. Don't. That's talking about look back with longing. That's acting like what I'm walking away from is better than what I'm going to. That's lack of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. God is a good God. And the thoughts that he has for you and the plans that he has for you are good, good beyond imagination. I've been excited this week. I'm just getting more excited as the days go by because I, I have it in my heart. God has brought us to this place for such a time as this. And 
His plan for us is exceeding wonderful and magnificent. Do you believe it? Oh, friend, I don't want to stop short. I don't want to come short. I want to go all the way. I want to go all the way down the path that the Lord has chosen for me. I want to walk in the fullness of his call and anointings for what I am to the body in my place. Don't you? Yes. Don't you? Yes. And how many believe that will be what satisfies you? Yes. That will be what gives you joy and what gives you peace. Yes. All these folk that are so disgruntled and so bitter and so unhappy, they're out of the will of God. Yes. Why? And it's not because God made it hard to find. It's because they had a better idea. One form of rebellion is procrastination. You know, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Just, just not. I can't do it right now. We'll do it maybe next year. We get all our stuff in better shape. And, and you know what happens next year? Maybe next year. Maybe next year. You know, I'll, uh, I'll get on a team maybe next year. Five years later. Maybe next year. Remember that, the fellow I was telling you about, the Lord got him out of debt supernaturally. He did some amazing things in that man's life. And I thought, for sure, I'm going to see him at registration at Red Rama. He wasn't there. And I, I, I wanted to find out what, what happened. Well, I could hear the first three words he said, uh-oh. Uh-oh, yeah, I heard that tone in his voice. You might know what I'm talking about. What tone is it? It's unbelief. And I knew he didn't have to tell me two sentences later. I knew why he didn't come. Fear. You stay where it's comfortable. It takes faith to step out, not knowing where you're going. Not knowing how it's going to work out. It takes faith. It ain't for the faint of the heart. Phyllis and I launched out. Two little country kids went to the city. Could not find a place to stay anywhere. They didn't have a fraction of the apartments they have now over there. We looked and we looked. We looked and we looked. And we're spending what little money we had on a hotel room. And we, we had barely enough to try to get registered, you know. Couldn't find a place. Couldn't find a place. Boy, those first few days, the devil talked to us. He said, what are you doing? <laughs> Stupid. You're out here, you've drugged your wife out here, you quit your job, what are you going to do? you got no place to stay, you're spending every dollar you got. So you, what if you get registered? Where's all the money going to come from for your tuition and everything else and on and on and on. And it sure looked that way. But we finally found us a little place, <laughs> fully furnished. <laughs> with well-used furniture. <laughs> and uh, we, we got registered. And uh, we believed God for every tank of gas and every pair of socks and insurance payment and tuition. And one thing led to another, led to another. But we were there. I said we were there. And oh man, every day, we're getting the Word of God pounded to us. It's a lot like listening to the tapes on the couch, only on a whole nother level. <laughs> now let's just stop right here. What happened last time? Huh? The two years of tapes on the couch. Got us to a place where we could receive the vision and have faith to step out to the next. So what's, what do you think is happening right now? We didn't know it. Huh? What do you think has been happening to you? Huh? What's going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we thought we'd go one year. One year. We thought, man, that'd be enough for anybody, right? I mean, 
we, we go one year, and we did. We finished our year. Glory to God, we made it through. And we're going to pack up and go back home. And uh, we thought, well, maybe we better pray about this before we just go. Good idea. <laughs> and you know, there was something scratching us. Don't go yet. Had no idea we'd be there another 20 years. No clue. And the Lord didn't say, Yea, thus saith the Lord, you shall serve here 10 years in this and 15 years in this, and then thou shalt go to Branson, and then thou shalt, uh, and then, mm -mm. <laughs> just a little scratch. <laughs> Am I right, Phil? We prayed that summer. We thought, well, because back then you could graduate when you went the one year just for the Bible training. They changed it right, that same year. And uh, scratch. Later on, I looked back and I realized, I thought, Lord, that was so serious in our life. Whether we went back home or you didn't. You didn't even give me anything strong. It was just a little scratch. And he said, well, it was enough, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, he prefers the less it takes. Yeah, means the more faith on your part yeah. means the more it pleases him. When you have to have three voices and a vision and five words, well, yeah. what's the problem? Why so reluctant? Why so slow? He said, that's all you needed. I knew you were doing it. I said, well, thank you for the scratch. <laughs> <coughs> and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And oh, thank God. Looking back now, you know, it's so much of the time while things are going on, you don't see that he's leading you. You believe it, you pray for it, you ask for it, you confess it. But looking back, as the years go by, you can look back and say, oh, glory to God. I was right where I needed to be. I was had me in the right place. The right uh, locations and the right associations. <laughs> we were allowed to be under the teachers there at Rama. I was... Uh, I became friends with uh, Patsy Bierman and uh, Dave, David Horton and several of us. I mean, we had some wild meetings. We, oh, glory to God. You should have been in some of those meetings. I think maybe you will be before too long. Uh, <coughs> but everything that we were doing, tent meeting, a hotel ballroom, you name it. I mean, we just, we, we were getting so pumped with the Word of God, we just believed anything was possible. That God could do anything, and He would do anything. And you just couldn't tell us that He couldn't. And we and we just try most anything. And some stuff we thought, wow, let's not try that again. But, <laughs> but other things, you're learning. I said, you're learning. How can you steer a parked car? I said, how can you steer a parked car? Well, Lord, direct me. You're sitting still. <laughs> Lord, turn me. You move. <laughs> There's no need to move the steering wheel, right? To move. Well, if you'll steer me, I'll move. <laughs> Nothing to steer. Oh, can you see this, friends? <laughs> One thing led to another. That's the way it always works. Follow him. Somebody say, follow him. Follow him. Say it again, follow him. Follow him. Go to uh, Romans 1. You go into Romans 1, then go also to Acts 13. We'll just go from one place to other. Romans 1 and then Acts 13. How can you find your place? There's a Godward part to it, and how many know He is faithful? 
He's already planned it out for you. He's already working in you to will and do of his good pleasure, right? He's got everything. You were born at the right time. He's, he's setting you up. Everything that's happening. He's, he, all you've got to do is what? You've got to believe him. You've got to have faith in him, right? And then what else must you do? You must follow. Follow by faith. Now we're going to get into the faithfulness that that works out to be. But notice this word in Romans 1. Romans 1 and 1. Put that up on the screen for us, please. Romans 1 and 1. What does it say? Paul. How many believe Brother Paul found his place? Did he develop in his graces? Yeah, absolutely. How did he get there? Huh? He was called. He, had, he, he acknowledged the call. Many are called. What must he have also done? He must have followed because he's obviously chosen. Called to be an apostle. Notice that next word. Separated unto the gospel of God. Separated. Before God could get us, Phyllis and I were supposed to be trained at Raymond Bible Training Center, we were supposed to be uh, a helps to Brother Hagen. Took some time getting us there, but we were supposed to be. But before we could ever get there, we had to be separated. We had to be separated from where we were and what we were doing. And then that separation can occur multiple times throughout your life. See, we were there for 20-some years, and then the Lord said, come to Branson. Well, we got a whole life there. You understand? We got friends. We got ministry. We got life. We now, now we got, you know, uh, relationships that are decades old. And here it comes again, a separation. Doesn't it? But when it's the Lord, is it a good separation? It's a separation from and a separation to. Oh, can you see this? Glory to God. Look in uh, Acts 13. He said, the Lord separated me. He called me to be an apostle, and he separated me to the gospel of God. How many know Paul used to be called Saul? He had another life. Didn't he? Very religious fella. <laughs> Wasn't he? And at one point he came to believe that he had the call of God to stamp out Christianity. Didn't he? He was fully convinced of it. And man, he seemed like he had the favor too. He had the favor with all the leaders. I mean, he just walks in and said, I want authority to go into this town and do this and do that. And they'd say, yeah, I gave him carte blanche, man. Gave him, you need to do anything you want to do. He was the Pharisee's star preacher. But that wasn't the plan of God, was it? He had a change. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. <laughs> and he got separated from his old life and what he was and did into something completely new. He said, God separated me unto the gospel. In Acts, the 13th chapter, you see a further separation after Paul's new birth experience on the road to Damascus. Some years later, Acts 13, verse 2, what does it say? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, what did he say? Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. They were already called. They had been called. But there came a time 
when they were separated until that call. Go to Galatians. I know I'm giving you some scripture, but uh, you need to know it's not my opinion. Galatians, the uh, first chapter. How many think this is important? Yes. Very. Galatians 1 and uh, 13. He said, you heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above my, many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. See, that's what, when people are off, like he was, they're not zealous about the Word of God. They're zealous about traditions. But when it pleased God, who what? Who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace. You keep hearing these two words, don't you? Called and separated. Many are called. Why are the few that are chosen, chosen? Because they will separate and follow. They will separate themselves from what would hold them to this life. And they will separate themselves unto. Does it take faith? Yes. Oh, it takes faith to forsake all and go to what? <laughs> Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Did that please God? It pleased God so much. He called him his friend. He said, come here, friend. I'm going to show you something. See all these stars? Count them for me, boy. He said, I can't. It's too many. He said, that's how many kids you're going to have. Look at it. Can you count all the sand? How many of faith pleases God when you will turn loose? These 12, how many know that's a big part of what qualified them? Why were they chosen? Because he knew they would walk away from their fishing boat. He knew they would walk away. Why are a lot of people don't receive further instruction about their call? Because they won't follow it. No, no matter what you told them, they wouldn't go. They're stuck. They got their mind made up. They got their plans. They got their things. There's no need telling them anything else. They're going to do what they're going to do. Did you read your chapters this week? Yes. Huh? Did you see the bunch that came to the man of God? And they said, oh, please, man of God, please pray for us. And whatever you say, the Lord be witness. We will do it because it's good for us when we do what the Lord tells us to do. We'll do it. He said, okay. And he prayed. And 10 days later, the word of the Lord came. And he said, don't go to Egypt. He said, oh, no. Now we're going to Egypt. <laughs> It's easy to talk a talk, isn't it? I mean, oh, we love the Lord and we just want his will and we just whatever he wants. And it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. He told them a little bitty something to do 10 years ago and they wouldn't do it. So they hadn't heard anything since about the plan. Why? He knows it wouldn't do any good to tell them. They're not going to do it. So they're unhappy. They take it out on their spouse and their kids and their dog and their fellow workers. And they're unfulfilled. They're dissatisfied. They're disgruntled. and They just feel like there's more. I just feel so unfulfilled. Well, <laughs> you should. I just feel like there's more. There is. I feel like I should be doing more. You should. But what's the problem? Can you see the problem, friend? What's the problem? Nobody wants to say it. What's the problem? Won't follow. Won't follow. But here Paul did. He said, he revealed his son to me, in me, verse 17, neither went up 
up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me. I went to Arabia. I returned to Damascus. After three years, I went to Jerusalem. Was he in the right place at the right time? What was going on with him? What if you could get this stuff straight tonight? It'd be worth staying all night. If you changed the rest of your life, you got on track, you got in the will of God. Look at the plants and animals God has created on the planet. Plants are made for locations. Aren't they? There are plants that thrive in this climate, in this place. You put them in this other place, they'll die. Right? And then the other plants that can handle, they can handle that cold. Or they can handle the extreme heat. Or they can handle the extreme dry. Others can't. They've got to have this. So does the plant have to be in the right place to flourish? Animals the same way, aren't they? Animals the same way. They're animals, you know, you, you take them out of this environment and take them, I mean, take a whale out of the ocean and put him in the desert. He cannot function in that environment. He will die. Right? You are the same way. I am the same way. God has foreordained the times we are to live in and our places and our associations. Hmm? In the right place, the right location will thrive. With the right influences and associations, we'll thrive. Yes. Hallelujah. The Lord had me. I, looking back now, I see it so distinctly. I was ready to go to Okinawa or Korea or wherever and sit at the feet of the sensei and, 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 and get the best training I could in the world and go through whatever I took. And I finally realized, thank God, I realized before I did something else 20 years, that God had another way. He had another plan. That wasn't his plan for me. I said, well, God, I need the same thing. I, I need to uh, show me where to go. I didn't know where to go, but within months I was sitting there at the feet of Brother Hagin and oh hallelujah year after year I began to learn didn't even know I was learning much of the time but I began to learn what my graces were and I was called on to do things that made me exercise in those areas it was uncomfortable at first but eventually it became to be comfortable to me oh, are you listening friends and year by year, year by year, and year by year, the anointing grew stronger and the grace grew greater until you begin to see, man, oh yeah, I didn't think this was my place, but this is it. I, this is, I was made for this. And this is for me. Oh, how wonderful to find your place and to get in your grace. And as the years have gone by, one thing leads to another, leads to another. I could tell it. Here comes some more. These years that the Lord has allowed me to be with you has allowed me to develop in another direction than where I was at and what I was doing, and it's prepared us for what's coming up right now, and I am excited. I'm excited. Listen to me, friend. Everything that has happened in your life up to now, God's been getting you ready for the next thing. A lot of things that seem natural, they're not so natural as you think. You are learning valuable lessons in them. And all you got to do is follow. You got to do it by faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Read, read John, just put it up on the screen. You don't have to turn there. But John, the uh, 10th chapter, we, we shouted about it uh, back some weeks ago on Sunday morning. Go ahead, stand up on your feet. John 10 and 27. What does it say? What does it say? My sheep. Hallelujah, my sheep, hear my voice. Is that you? Are you his sheep? Yes. My sheep, hear my voice, and I know them. Tell me the next part. And they, they follow me. 
Somebody say, that's me. That's me. Close your eyes. Let me lead you in this prayer. Father God, I'm convinced you knew what you were doing when you made me, when you made us all. And you have created us and predestined us for specific places and specific paths that we are to walk. And you didn't make it hard for us. You didn't hide it from us, but you prepared it for us. Forgive me. Any times I didn't follow you. I was too scared or too preoccupied, too selfish, whatever, that I didn't follow you. I repent. Have mercy on me. Help me to see and know clearly any things I've ignored and didn't do. I want to follow you. My heart is to follow you. By faith, I say I'm willing to do anything, go anywhere, stay anywhere, help anybody, do any job that you tell me to do. Help me, and I'll not be rebellious. By your grace, I purpose not to be stubborn, not to be proud, not to be disobedient, but to follow you and to follow you fully. Praise God. Praise God.